On behalf of Parsons and the New School, we're thrilled to welcome you to the TDC at Parsons Lecture Series with Neville Brady tonight. I'm especially excited because when I first uh, started practicing design, Neville Brady's work was one of the very first I was introduced uh, to and continues to inspire today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the TDC Vice President, Elizabeth. Well, these 
things are unnerving. And thank you both for that warm. See, that's what you're supposed to do. I know. And the musical Parson, which is where we are. I've not been in this one. I was at the, the other one. Right, on 12th Street. On 12th Street. The Old The Old the old tissue. Uh, the old the old tissue. <laughs> um, there's site network. Um, I just want to extend a real big thanks to you guys for the support and getting us here today. And then there's us. This is Brody Fonts. This is the first event that's been done under that banner. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. I'm told not to be too commercial. <laughs> Um, and I just wanted to also, um, Carol didn't mention the real story of Type 87, um, which is that I turned up from the airport and um, just turned up, I had a jacket on, I had a bag, I just run in. The conference was just about to start and I ran downstairs. Um, this was at the high end. Uh, no, it was the uh, Grand Hyatt. Uh, yes, the Grand Hyatt. The Grand Hyatt as well. And um, when I ran in and the guys at the desk, there was three women at the desk, they were taking all the people's registrations, they said to me, oh, thank God you're here. And I said, great. I said, down this way. Because um, I wanted to see, I think, Adrian Fruit had started speaking. Um, and they took me down this corridor, and then another corridor which got narrow, and then another corridor which got narrow. And eventually, this tiny dark corridor, and then they opened the cupboard, and they said, it's in here. And I said, what's in here? And I said, well, you are the electrician, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> I was upstairs working. And you were upstairs. Yeah. Well, you don't know. But you did get to the dinner. You got to see Adrian get the medal. I got to the dinner. Um, and, and thanks to Carol, I met Roger, Roger Pack. He's here. I met um, Eric Spiegelman and David Burler. And that set up actually a lot of the work we've done ever since in, in Fonts. Um, so really my main job here tonight is to introduce you to Oscar. Where's Oscar? Oscar's in the room. Oscar's offered to take over from me in the speech tonight, if, in the lecture tonight, if I fail at any point. I've given him my notes and um, he's well equipped. it. So thank you, Oscar. Um, so I don't really know what the theme of tonight is. It, it's kind of talking about time. At the heart of the work we've done in the little night. Is that for me? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, we've got about an hour. I'm going to I'm going to show you too much work um, and talk about it and try and thread together some of the kind of ideas behind some of the things we've been doing and the kind of social cultural context for some of that work. Um, this is me. Um, I tried to make it to be Roger, but he said he's. And I started, I was at, I was at London Culture Printing in 19... It's, I mean, Jesus Christ, 76 to 79. Um, and this was the age where punk allowed us to kind of rethink what the Jesus were telling us. And it allowed us to rethink the kind of languages that we were being told we had to use. Um, and that there were certain ways of doing typography that were pretty fixed. If you did a wedding invite, it was done in a certain way. If you did a, a theatre announcement, it was done in another way. Um, but we said, rightfully, I think, um, what if those ways are out of date? What if they're outmoded? What if they're not relevant to the societies and civilizations that we now are? Uh, and it encouraged me. I was very inspired and influenced by Dadaism and futurism and constructivism at that time. And those people told me that anything could be possible, that 
you could reinvent stuff that you thought was fixed and that things were only fixed because certain people want them to be fixed in order to benefit from them. So we challenged everything. Um, they tried to throw me out. Um, I started exploring everything I hated typography. Uh, I didn't understand what the point was. I um, still don't sometimes. Um, but everything was done by hand and we didn't have computers. Uh, there was some degree of photo setting, but that was about it. So everything had to be developed by hand and drawn by hand and drawn at a large size and scale down. We had to hand render everything. So we couldn't just drop type into InDesign or, or Quiet Express. So every single thing had to be hand rendered at a kind of six or seven point type size, um, which messed my eyes up. Um, but we were judged on the quality of our rendering as much as how rigidly we stuck to the core design rules. But I tried to break those rules, I tried to make stuff more expressive and I, I rejected the idea completely that graphic design is about problem solving because I said if you think that you're going to solve problems then all you're communicating is the fact that you tried to solve the problem. So everything is the, the solution, rather than a free, different thought that allows you to rethink the original question. As I moved into doing design in the 80s, the way we did our work was completely different to the way it is now. Everything had to be physically pasted onto the board and overlay sheets, and you needed to imagine everything because it was only black and white. You had to imagine every single colour. You had to imagine how things would reverse out of pictures. You'd have to imagine how a picture would scale up, and then you'd have to instruct that to the printer, who then skillfully reinterpret those hundreds of instructions into exposing film on top of each other until finally you have the four different plates. Then you print your four colour. And for me, the, the computer was, was a way of um, looking at things immediately. So for us, it might take weeks before you'd even understand how something was going to look. And we were talking about this with our clients in Japan the other day, that if we were working in Japan, the fastest courier to show ideas would probably be two days or three days before they could see anything. So we have then another three days before they would send their responses back to you. So in one week, um, you would have newer instructions. Times have changed hugely, obviously. Um, and at the time, we would also have to draw every single piece of type by hand. Um, so this, this kind of work was done at really large size, would, re would be reduced down. The reason I'm thinking about these things is because as technology changes, so does our languages and uh, the way we use our languages. And this is the very first Rebel cover I did. Um, Ten inch rebel cover, big label. Uh, two colours because we couldn't afford full colour printing at the time. Um, interesting labels. And then I did a lot of work as a, as a freelance. Um, and again, the reason I'm showing this is because I think a lot of these things have continued in my work. There was always an interest for me about the state of mankind state of humankind and how environmental changes would affect who we are, the way we think, and the way we react with each other. And every single species, whether sentient or not, on the planet, um, has a degree of communication. Even trees we've discovered now have the ability to communicate with other trees through fungal networks. Um, and they talk to each other, obviously a bit slower than the text. So every species uses language and communication. And every species uses it to communicate two things. First of all, what is, what is constant? Um, who am I? Where am I? Um, who are we? What is our species? And then things that change. So language is often used to represent change, but the languages we create often don't enable that change to occur because they're so restricted.
In our studio, we focus quite a lot on things which are ambiguous and the loss of clarity and language. We explore the edge, I think, of, of clarity. See, for us, the relationship with the viewer is so important in the sense that we treat the viewer as someone equal to us in the sense of we don't own this message. Um, only half of it is fixed. The rest of it is up to whoever's looking at it to complete that process. So it's a kind of poetic process where everything we do is a dialogue, not a monologue. And we explore the edges of typographic form to see at what point it ceases to become a familiar letter and in doing so allows new changes and possibilities to happen. And we experiment a lot and we play a lot because I think that play is a hugely important <coughs> part of what we do. It's not all fixed system building. It's not all fixed rules and structures and kerning. Um, so we play as much as we can and embrace that certainly as a large part of every single project we work with whether it's with a client or for a cultural area. And sometimes the clients don't quite get that. They, they want to run things as shopping lists. So you go from A to Z, and I said Z because I'm the So you go from A to Z. Um, but you go through, through predefined steps in order to get to Z. Because we think that you should kind of, kind of know where Z is, but then you can take a much larger curve and use that large curve to explore different possibilities and thoughts. And I love the point at which things start to collapse because new possibilities and ideas happen at that, that point. But we've been trying to force kind of digital media to become a bit more fluid. These are all generated digitally and just thinking about how we can push that media into something which is more organic. And I said before that um, in digital media, the art is never fixed, it never sets, it's always fluid and can always be changed. So the purpose of these what I call utilitarian spaces, you know, like Facebook, etc., their goal is to try and restrict your movement in order to deliver maximum profit. Um, whereas we much more support something which is more fluid and actually the weight of power goes then to the user or the person using it. And we embrace mistakes, so things that go wrong sometimes are the things that go right for us. So this is pushing some 3D programming to the point where it didn't work. New things would happen, bits would fall out, and actually for us it, it launched a period of new possibilities. Um, so understanding what goes wrong as well, um, and embracing failure is a huge part of, of what we should be doing. And eventually it led to things like this, which was the cover for the postmodernist exhibition for the, the Victorian Albert Museum. Did you say royalty? Who said royalty? It's just, just triggered. <laughs> um, I think there's more interest in the law family here than there is in the world. We don't get it. Well, you have the now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, growing is a natural process. Sometimes the very thing that you have is everything that you need. This is for a magazine cover for plus 81. And we realized that just by turning the logo sideways, you can form a face from it. So we didn't add anything to this at all. We just simply slightly changed what existed to create a new meaning from it. And the same here, this was the 10th anniversary cover for Italian GQ magazine. And the, the bird grew out of expanding the one on the zero. Um, and then we sent it off and they said, great, um, we love the fact that you didn't do any cover lines. And then we realized we'd forgotten to put the cover lines on. <laughs> um, which we didn't tell them. <laughs> And this was my poster for, um, it was a group of posters done by designers to celebrate or not um, when we had the Olympics in London. Um, and for, the, for me, this is all about running, running readings. Um, and for part
binoculars from a post built that was a printer came back and said that um, we'd spelt it wrong and that the eye was missing from anxiety and they said that that was the intent. So we took the eye out of all of the, the um, sentences and texts of this campaign uh, because at the end of the day when people have Parkinson's they tend to forget who they are. So it's a complete loss of identity. And at the other end of the extreme we did the campaign poster an identity for, for one, which was the campaign to raise signatures to help bring governments to realize the degree of poverty around the world. So for here again, it was, it was a reductive process where something really simple could be everything that we need. Uh, wallpaper magazine we did um, cover and the typography for a special issue. We'd actually given them stencil time. They then cut out that time. Um, on paper, and then we photographed it and we produced that in the magazine as the headlines. And the cover, which I've got rid of the, um, the name wallpaper, um, it's actually printed white on white, so you can't see it. Um, and it's, it actually says, I hate design. <laughs> I didn't explain to them. <laughs> and then sometimes words. Um, mean a lot uh, in the sense that we were working for um, a, an embedded art exhibition in Berlin and it was, it was the idea of embedded artists uh, artists that normally go to the, the war front and then send back images and expressions and impressions of war and so they were having an embedded art exhibition in Berlin that was a reflection on, on how society is being in the front line of a war between surveillance, ownership, and individuality. So freedom from freedom is all about how much freedom we've given up for security. And that security is being used as a mechanism for us to give up our freedoms. And we're not allowed to argue with any of that. And I'm sorry, but the dog should go down the front desk here, Carol. Um, it was a bit struggling. We'll talk about it after. But sometimes expressions of power can, can be um, used, I guess not cruelly, but un unfairly. People have positions of power, and only the slight difference in terms of, at that particular instance, what that relationship is, but then it becomes very polarized in that instance. And this is what's happened to our freedoms. Um, we've given them up, we can't take water on planes, um, we can be yelled at for this. Um, and all the way down now to, you know, are we allowed to cross the street if the, if the light is red? And it's also to do with levels of surveillance. I mean, these have been in my work for, for a very long time, these kinds of considerations. Um, and most of my work is based, certainly the exploratory stuff, is based on the idea of, of personal liberation through breaking rules and trying alternative possibilities. And the fact that the skills people have now at knowing who you are and the data shadow that you create, um, again, coming back to places like Facebook who have such a, an accurate understanding of who you are and Google, etc. Um, that their model is something that's reflected back so accurately that you don't even realise you're being manipulated. Anyway, this is about typography. So. <laughs> um, sometimes we do one of the for. Um, we did this for Michael Mann. We've done most of his film titles, which has been quite exciting. Um, lots of black hat, and then for this we developed the, the typeface of Gordon New Deal. For this, the Public Enemies uh, film, we felt that it, it captured an era that was so in parallel with the current time, which was the um, Wall Street crash and the depression of the 30s. And then recently we've done other kinds of work where we're exploring typography at the heart of of social thinking and uh, tribal thinking. 
and we worked with Supreme on a, on a capsule collection where they were kind of quite inspired by some of the work that was done in, in the early 80s as a, as a kind of parallel to what was happening now in the US. And it's a challenge for us because um, I, I never like to go back to stuff that's been done in the past. Um, but it was very interesting to see it reimagined for a contemporary usage. Um, this is Wayne Rooney. Uh, who even knows Wayne Rooney? Yeah, there's a few in the old cards. <laughs> <laughs> Just about. Uh, Wayne Rooney is, is um, not playing in the World Cup from tomorrow. But he played in the last World Cup and we did all of the numbers for the shirts, um, which is a big honour. I mean, it's like working for the Queen. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, if she played football, that would be our perfect <laughs> combination. Um, but we were working with Nike and we wanted to do something quite radical, but unfortunately the Football Association kept telling us to um, make things much more legible. So that was the age for us, legibility against something that was more expressive. And I realized during this process that actually the reason why it has to be legible isn't because the referee needs to know, because the referee knows who all the players are, and so do all the other players, and then so do the, the commentators. But it's the people watching on a mobile phone. So somehow technology changes what we have to do in our own lives because of the way it's recorded and then redistributed. So it cycles back in and just changes. So it changes our languages again. Team games, 50th gold shirt. That is such a fan. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't being streamed. No, but we are recording. So can you cut that? <laughs> um, at the end of the other, sorry, at the other end of the extreme, we do work again, which is so simplified. So this is the new monograph for Christian Dior. And they came to us with a problem which is that their logo needed to be super simple, it needed to be scalable, it needed to work from this size to huge on the store, and it needed to be reversible so that it didn't matter which way up it went on the product. And on top of that, it needed to be made out of one piece so that they could make a buckle or put it as a clasp on the boot. Um, and so what we ended up with was something that, so if you have anything like this in your, it doesn't matter which way you put the lid, um, it still reads the correct way. So sometimes you have to reduce the DNA to such a small degree of, of technical precision um, because it needs to work in a hundred different places. As on the store. Um, for my sins, I'm at the Royal College right now. Um, I'm Dean. Um, I'm stepping down as Dean actually in September, uh, eight years, I think that's a record for the college. Um, and we rebranded when I joined. We essentially changed the red to a blue, which is more regal, and ranged everything left instead of centered everything. And in ranging it left, we allowed a lot more dynamic possibility um, and a lot more dynamic placement of, of objects. Uh, this was for the 175th anniversary of the college. It's the oldest still in existence art school in the world right now. And they asked me to develop a typeface for them that could be used on all their communications. We took this great typeface by um, Margaret Calvert, who was an ex professor there. And it's quite standard. I worked quite closely with her on the thinking, and she allowed me to do a complete remix. So what we did was we, we pushed the edges of the, of the font until it came in and started to break apart. And it was a bit too narrow, so we made it wider. And then what we went in and did was started to clean up these spaces. So this is the first tranche of what happened, and starting to clean it up a bit further. Um, and then this is, we ended up with three weights, actually the bowl is in here. Um, the idea was that it would be reducible and scalable 
So such a small size that it would work because of its high level of contrast. And then when it was used very large and in display, you would start to get interested in the shapes themselves. So it became a far more graphic expression. So here were the sketches we did, and then here is the, the reality. So we're, this allowed us to treat any surface as part of the fabric of the college. So whether it was concrete, wood, on screen, in print, on glass. So here it is in situ in a new lighting building. And then in a big printmaking space. And it allowed a highly scalable, as I said, um, environment where no matter where you were, it was an extension of the college's surface and environment. Isimiyaki um, had a very different kind of challenge for us, which was that the store in Tridecker was the first time they brought all of their brands together in one place. And so we felt it was key to take slices or sections of each logo and assemble them together. And each time it was used, it would vary again. So again for us, the idea of a living language is critical. It's, it's important. It's important that things aren't fixed, that things can move and change. So here on the left, on the right, on the left, is the architectural plans for the, for the space. Um, it was designed by Frank Geary, the, the shop itself. And then we took the same kind of lettering but extruded it to create something that was beyond legibility but expressed both the um, the name of the space and the architectural quality of Tribeca itself. And these then went out as advertising in uh, different fashion magazines. And it was quite a shock for most people that they didn't include models. It was actually shifting the language towards something which could be interpreted in, in a very different way and wasn't about beauty or balance or status. And then zooming in, so using scale in a much more radical way. Uh, this was the, the bag design they flat, and that's how it turned out, which actually was a problem for the back of people's legs in the street. <laughs> but it looked great for the two months they were on. And for the opening, we, we laser cut letters out of a piece of aluminium um, and that then developed as the typeface for the next campaign that we ran with them. So it's this constant flow of change and evolution that then we re stenciled back in and used as a language and the idea of having things drop out and cut out led to the catalogue where we um, die cut into the whole catalogue to reveal all kind of two books. So you had a book on the inside where pages could combine with other pages. Um, and the other one we had actually was that they haven't paid their modules, so we had to hide the faces. <laughs> but sometimes these challenges, I mean we're graphic designers, sometimes these challenges lead to new thoughts about things and new possibilities. So sometimes challenges we hate them as professionals, but um, they can force, I guess, um, inspire or, or challenge new thoughts that lead to other things. So out of this process, then we commissioned Ian Wright, the English illustrator, um, to do some work in the space around the heads. And this, this is a, um, I guess, a five metre high head. What's that mean? 15, 16, 16 feet high. Um, and he did a whole exhibition around it, so we were constantly moving with the narrative. At the other end of the extreme, um, we redesigned the Times newspaper. This was in, I can't believe the date, 2008. Oh my god, 10 years ago, Luke. Because Luke, Luke's here, um, Luke worked very closely with us in developing of the, the new fonts for this. Um, they've gone from uh, a big um, broadsheet size to a tabloid and haven't changed their approach to putting a newspaper together. So it's like they've moved from a, a mansion 
into a one bedroom flat and they've taken all their belongings with them. So we had to go in and, and start trying to help them decide what they needed and what they didn't. And we said that unlike most newspapers, you turn up every day to work and for you it's a new theatre, it's a new piece of drama. And um, you have to tell stories. So what we're going to give you is a box of props, a box of graphic form and shapes and ideas and opportunities and different ways to present information. So that each day you can come in and roll your sleeves up and, and give a new piece of drama on the stage. So previously they'd be writing like four pages of text, but we said no, it's a kind of maximum limit and you have to break the page up. And at the same time, um, in reducing down, we had to redesign the masthead. And these are all the masters. It's the world's oldest newspaper. And these are all the masters they've had since the beginning. And it was only around 1966 that they actually stopped running classified advertising on their front cover and started to put news stories and pictures. And that was quite shocking for us. Now, this is only um, 70 years. Yeah. 72. Yeah. 72 years. Thank you, Carl. No, not 72. It's um, 50, it's 50. <coughs> so we're confused. If it's 62, it's 56 years. Right? It was 66, so it's 52 years. Okay. <laughs> So, so I'll start this again. <laughs> <laughs> so what we did is we looked at all the mastheads from the beginning. Um, this is the world's always newspaper. Um, in 1966, 52 years ago, um, <laughs> it was the first time they stopped using classified on the cover and started using photography and many other stories. Um, so we took that as our starting point, and it's a long way through it. It's um, right at the top in the middle. Um, so this is what it was, and it was kind of a Trajan, it was a sharp serif cut. And this is what they were using when we came in. And so what we did is we created a kind of a combination of the two. We, we kept the modern proportion, but we brought in the uh, sharp serifs like this. And one of the reasons why we then developed that as a full character set and a number of fonts was because we needed to get more words in the line because the page is narrower. Uh, we needed it to go down much smaller and uh, to, newspaper quality is, is great. You don't get much contrast, so we had to go for high contrast for legibility. Um, and at the same time we made sure that the X height was large, which allowed um, air and space inside to make it much more legible. So we've got not only the main story, but we've also got an introduction to it because on the internet we appreciate and ingest information in a very different way now. We need introductions so we don't read things. Um, on the right is a list, so you can read the stories and list of events in order. There's two pull quotes. Um, at the bottom of the left hand page there's an opinion piece. Um, at the bottom right, there's an indication that you can find out more information online. All of these things are clustered together now using the um, titles at the top, so you can have a number of different things happening at the same time. And we help them understand that two pictures, which were actually very mediocre, if they were cropped in the right way and placed accordingly, you could tell a dramatic story in themselves. Um, and then at the bottom right is an ad that you don't even notice now because there's so much else going on. And we did the same with all of those stories. We developed um, a, a visual graphic illustration style for them. We help them understand that numbers are big keys to understanding stories. And even allowing the idea that they could use pictures across spreads which they haven't been doing before. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff. We actually ended up doing something like 160 major changes for them. And their brief to us had been to change everything, but make sure <coughs> nobody noticed. <laughs> and make the logo bigger. <laughs> <laughs> the 
BBC is a very different situation we had. For them, uh, there was, I think, 400 top level sites within the BBC umbrella. And they asked us to create a system by which everything could be built and related to each other. So we helped them build what, what's called a patterns library, which is a set of modules that anyone can pull into a grid and build any page they want. And at the same time, if they come up with new modules, they can add those to the library. And we created a grid, and we also helped them create a sense of layers. So at the bottom right, there's this idea that if you click, it becomes a drawer that opens or closes. And on the left, using the same modules, but giving them a slightly different visual flair. It makes you feel you're on a different website, but it's actually sharing the same structure and core personality. And some of the modules we created for them, um, we, I mean, this is 2009, so it's about the same time as the Times. Um, moving at the time, they had the play button right in the center of the image, which meant it always sat over the face. Uh, so we helped them understand that you need to move stuff out, again, ranging, adding stuff to edges, and it gives it a more dynamic use. Um, and then underneath all of that, building, and this is a part of it, a, a huge icon language, so that all the different bits of the site could be sharing the same fundamental building blocks. Uh, we created a long manual for them, um, which they ignored. <laughs> it's just fine. Um, but but Patterns Library still exists, and they're using that still to build everything. Um, so sometimes the lesson might be you don't need to spend six months designing a manual. This happened um, 40 years after Punk. The mayor of London, at the time was Boris Johnson, Al Trump. Um, I think he has more hair. Um, the, the mayor of London's office came to us and said they were celebrating 40, 40 years of punk, um, which we thought was a pretty funny statement. <laughs> Especially as London was trying to kind of break down punk and destroy it at the time. Um, but they had a number of venues and events and um, talks and discussions and exhibitions all happening at the same time. They wanted us to help find a way of linking everything. So, um, we produced a typeface that anyone could use, but we just gave it away. So anyone that was doing anything to do with the event, so that everything that went out there would share this core, core font. So no matter what happened, um, and they could do quite radically different things, there was a connection between everything. So sometimes the font is a way of building a community and allowing different parts of that community to be free and individual, but still speak the same basic language. Um, how am I doing for time? Am I really sure? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. There's some people that need to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so for Coca-Cola, they approached us originally to do a poster celebrating 100 years of the console model. And again, we thought the best way to express it would be the bottle itself. So we repeated and turned by hand um, enlarged versions of the contour until we ended up with this. And then started cropping in to look at different versions which could be applied as the poster itself. And this is where we ended up on that. So giving a sense of flow, and this is all, it's done digitally, but each one is done by hand, so it's not being pre-calculated. And then as you're enlarging it, the mistakes enlarge, and you get thicker and thinner lines happening. And then out of that relationship, Coca-Cola asked us to produce the typeface for um, uniting all the different parts of the, the company, the 250 or products they have, all the different territories, and this is the first time they've done this in 130 years of existence. Um, and it was a great honor again, working very closely with Luke. Um, and looking at something that felt very modern, and with 
the degree of functionality that they were seeking. But at the same time, having some of the Coca-Cola personality, um, which is very hard to pin down. So we had the opportunity, we spent three days in their archives, which were amazing. Uh, we didn't want to come out. Mm -hmm. um, and ended up developing this, so it's slightly extended, so it feels a bit more luxurious. So it's not so time tied by being short. It's very clean, big excite, very open. Um, uh, we've now designed quite a few different weights and we're also doing the condensed. Um, and our inspiration largely came from, I'm not going to show you all of it because we've got hundreds of these examples, but picking up different bits of the typographic history. And it was such a fun thing to do, picking up um, things that were had all been largely drawn by uh, hand letters at the time. And then seeing those as things that we could incorporate into the modern version of that. So picking up certain things, um, running workshops with, with the cover team and understanding which bits were relevant and work together. And then building in very small but key characteristics. So again, so that the, the font would work small and large with personality. Using the O of the Coca-Cola, um, making sure things were um, slightly unbalanced as opposed to balanced. And the end result is something that you would never notice. <laughs> Which was kind of the intent really. You know, I think sometimes typography should be seen and not heard. And it should just work. And it should just feel right. Um, sometimes it demands attention and forces you to challenge your thinking about certain things. Um, new ideas always need systems in order for, for us to assimilate them. Uh, but sometimes you just need systems. So somehow the, the font feels natural for Coca-Cola and you wouldn't really notice that it had changed. But Channel 4 is a very different story. For them, they wanted something with personality that expressed their Britishness and their slight eccentricity. Um, channel 4 was one of the four main UK TV channels, national channels. channels. And they see themselves as quite maverick and irreverent. Um, so we created two typefaces for them, one which was very standard and the other which was a kind of angry cousin. Or a wayward uncle that comes in and throws the plates off the table. And our starting point was looking back over the last kind of hundred years of the British Gothic and British grotesque. Things that lead to things like the transport font that Margaret Calvert did for the um, British road signs. And she also did our transport system and the hospital type. So we used that as our starting point. And ended up here. So Chadwick is the typeface they use for all of their news um, sports and information. And Horse Ferry is a kind of bastardized version of that where things started misbehaving. In order to arrive at, at, at um, which characters should be changed, um, we created four different random, slightly crazy relatives, all the different characters, and brought them together, and then started to pick what would work best with each other. And actually based it on um, Luke's work, looking at frequency of usage of letters. So we didn't pick everything, we just picked the ones that would appear more often. And the others we left straight, like the S and the Y. And the overlays, the differences are quite subtle, but enough to make shifts. And they wanted a typeface so that when they used it, you would know that it was Channel 4 without needing to have the logo. So now when you watch them on the screen, certainly, um, they do ident with, with the, the typeface like this. And you know, everyone in the UK will know immediately that it's Channel 4. So sometimes, and more and more, brands and cultures are not brands in the same way that we used to know them. 
the more entities that tell the stories. And for them, what's the important thing is how that story is told. So in that instance, the typeface itself becomes absolutely central to the way that story is told. And it becomes part of the constants of telling that story. It becomes like a tribal marking, in a way. This is the way it was launched the fun. <coughs> Um, I'm going to run through a couple of things quite quickly because I don't it's quite late and it's a Thursday and it's a school day, right? <laughs> um, previously, we've just, we've, well, we've just about finished this now, it's been four years in the making. Now, Samson asked us to, to create a, a typeface that connected all of their different spaces. Up until then, like mobile, um, domestic products, TV, um, computers um, in store had all been using different typefaces because they were set up as an independent division. So they asked us to create something which united all of the different parts of the Samsung experience to make it more common. And we developed for them an icon system, which I'm not showing you now, but um, we helped them deliver to all of their platforms a, a typeface which worked all the way down to just a few pixels and all the way up to um, banners and selling stores and global advertising. And the interesting thing for us was not only did it have to be functional in both of those instances, it had to be highly purposeful and a uh, real mechanism. And at a large size, again, it had to have a degree of personality that disappeared when it was at a small size. We started to build in some, some characteristics that were both efficient and hopefully bring in some kind of personality that grew as the font enlarged. So we had um, slightly square circles that allowed a lot of air inside, and the ends of the arcs, so the C and the R, were quite open, which allowed a lot of air to run through, but it also increased legibility because you need to be reading lines pretty quickly. Again, quite a large egg site. Um, little things like the, the tail or the owl um, and the fact that the X itself was slightly higher than the normal X height. And then constants of width. And out of all of this, it gave us a number of characteristics that we then applied to developing, look how many international scripts do we do? No, you can't say that. Um, we've done around um, 126 different international scripts now, um, from Arabic to Greek to Hebrew to Ethiopic to Lay to Lao, rather to Thai to um, a number of Indian languages. Um, and it's connecting something like 260 uh, different spoken languages. And this is why it's taken four years. We've done uh, nearly 30,000 individual glyphs in that process. And all of it is sharing the core Samsung DNA. So it's all sharing how a curve and a line join together, for instance. It's sharing how the end of the, the stem might curve or, or stay straight. But these little spurs are constant throughout. Um, the ends of the curves all have the same approach to, to being perpendicular, which is kind of at right angles to the curve. So out of that, we can both standardize and localize different languages, so that when they're used in the same environment, so quite often you'll be using Latin with Cyrillic, um, when they're used in the same environment, they, they work seamlessly together. And then this is the end result. So again, it's something that you, you shouldn't and probably don't notice. Um, but it's, it's a typeface that does what it's supposed to do, which is it, it works. It's not supposed to be drawing attention, but it's supposed to be making things operate smoothly. This I'm going to run through quickly. Um, this is for a film's conference. Uh, 
let's say, modern, and we felt that a gridded system was the best way to capture this. And this is an early version of the Buffalo font, which I'll be talking about in a minute. Um, out of that, we used um, highlighting systems that um, Adobe PDF allows you to use because they have interesting curves on each end. And scaling and keeping it very simple. It felt very much like a kind of um, a photocopied document on the inside. And that allowed us to have a language which extended to other media. Um, we created an app for it across both tablets and phones. Um, now I'm going to go way back. So this is 1985, 33 years. I think I did that one. <laughs> and the face for me, because I hated typography, as I said at the time, and the face allowed me to kind of really rethink really what typography was about. And for me, it was all about image making. I wasn't so interested in how it should work, more about what it communicates. But at the same time, I understood that we understood that you needed systems and grids and structures and commonalities. You can't, you can't just go and break a window. Um, that's going to mean nothing. But if you break every third window on the street, that in itself becomes more disturbing because it's more systematic. <laughs> a single piece of violence or vandalism doesn't have effect but we're more disturbed when it happens in a cyclic way. So things that we're familiar with and comfortable with, um, if they get changed on a regular basis, that becomes disturbing and then that creates a space where new possibilities can happen. Um, this is all pre-digital. So I was drawing and cutting up each headline by hand on this. And we'll do the whole magazine in one week. So we'd have to stick down the night before all this, the texts. Um, we'd have to hand cut, make corrections to words, and slice the word along. We'd draw up my hand at large size, reduce down. You'd often have the messenger, the bike messenger at the door waiting for your layout to go to the printers. And it allowed experimentation. So for me, um, if it was functionally based and those reasons were clear, we would keep that. If they weren't functionally based, then they became questions of taste or tradition or culture, and then they would be, they would be challengeable. So you might have, um, you might need to know where you're on the magazine. So historically, traditionally, you would use page numbers. But actually, you could use anything that was of a consecutive change. So you could use a shape that grew bigger or something that turned. So for us, some of the functionality was, was maintained, but then the cultural interpretation of that was, was changeable. So here, this is the Madonna piece we did. Um, and then the next issue, this is a piece on Warhol, where we looked at his reusable. Idea. You can even you can still see the, the small bit of the Madonna's head mm -hmm. on the bottom left. So we could experiment and we could play with convention. We could crop photographs in different ways. And then for Arena magazine, we did the opposite. We took a fixed typeface and tried to use it emotively, emotionally. And we forced ourselves to take on, on Helvetica and try to make it respond in a more poetic, expressive and emotive manner. Trying to think about, and this is something that stayed in my work since, think about the flow of the air around something. Almost more than what's happening in the solid areas. And then Arena on Plus, which we came to about three years ago, we started actually looking at British reggae record stores as our starting point and looking at the fact that these record labels would probably be done really fast at home with one colour or two colour printing 
and no budget, but they had to have real impact to go on the walls of these record stores. So we took that sense and idea of impact, and I really things were thinking about how space would work, how things could move in more than one dimension on a two-dimensional plane, how things could be cut up on pages, again, thinking about how the space became as important as the solid areas. And then developed a typeface for the first issue that we worked with them on, which we called Propaganda. And then decided to use it using the same principles, which is that kind of scale of impact. And then thinking also about the space. So here we introduce something that's creating something unusual, um, in that we've gone off grid, but we've put an invisible grid inside. So the headline creates a new poetry, kind of poetry concrete. But it actually says Ralph Simmons, 15 years. But we all tend to, to read across. And there's other things happening here, which is there's a deliberate echo with the angle of the model on the right hand page with the model on the left hand page. So you've got to kind of moving out. There's an echo of the headline and the suit. So you've got these two areas of dark that balance each other. There's a kind of horizontal line that comes from his eyes all the way down to the, the bottom left hand corner. And then it's, it's held by this vertical line and the two balance of the, the balance of the two quotes. Um, and all of this is off grid. So it's taking a more painterly approach to things. And the same here, cropping and moving an image to reverse what you would normally expect as a relationship. And then impacting out, but setting at an angle um, and allowing the type to, to kind of almost attack the text. Thrillers and a great Nick Knight story about um, bounces and two teams, as you would. Um, Judy Blaine shot a great London stylist shot in the only spare space you could find in this house where we could actually get a photographer in as well. And then flipping things and making things work. So I think things should be complex and difficult. There's so much easy stuff and I don't think language should be there just to make things easy. Um, I think then it becomes entropic, it becomes reduced to the smallest, lowest common denominator, which like tweets or, or um, updates. And here we're using the white space to push down oppressively on the type. Um, and reversing it to make something feel oppressive. We're using typography itself in, in as poetic and painted a structure as possible. Things happen, there's discoveries. Uh, nothing should be as you expect it. And for the second issue we worked with them, we, we took the same typeface but sliced bits out, which would deliver us some interesting shapes to play with. And because it became so abstract, we then brought in um, some uh, serif conventional classical typography again. But allowing the shapes themselves to, to bring presence to the page. So these are all systems. And the systems are there and they're created at the beginning of each issue. And then the systems are then pushed to, to introduce some unexpected or, or creative interpretations. So we always experiment, we always push. And again here, trying to think of the echo between the shape of the model and the shape of the typography. Picture juxtaposition is, is super critical for us. How you can tell stories simply by which pictures you choose to sit with each other. Independently, these pictures will mean something quite different. This is the S from the typeface, but just simply doubled and, and moved to create something which is a bit more sculptural. How am I doing? How am I? What was that? Okay. No, I'm just worried about keeping everyone up. And I don't, I don't want to put my phone on. Normally I have it here and it's turning. It's going beep, 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 beep. The 
third issue took a typeface we did for the Mike Tyson boxing match for the poster um, in Tokyo. But we wanted to create something that was, was late Tyson, um, where he discovered something a little more sensitive. So we made it softer and lighter and more elegant and more poetic. And we used it in a much more kind of a, a dance, um, engaged, flowing kind of way. And it gave us pages like this. So this was the third issue. We moved again. Where we're trying to think of the, I mean, this is an artificial thing again where the outside has been moved in. And it's created these very elegant shapes. Um, and ironically being reused for a boxing story. And then we always find natural positions for things within the structure. Everything we do has its internal logic. We don't have a logic and then put things into that. We develop the logic from inside. And we understand or try to understand the relationship between everything. Because then it can create an energy. And it, it delivers something much more than just a kind of structured space. And you don't have to fill every format. In fact, the less you put, the better. And part of the issue was using song lyrics. So this is, I will be king, you will be queen, David Barry. But again, trying to see how things will interlock internally to create something more than just the use of the words. I'm going to run through this. Swiftly, this is an independent magazine that's come out of Paris. Um, we've managed to experiment quite a bit with the form, the physical form of this. Um, the Vandals isn't printed. It's, it's split into, and the number is split into single page pieces and put on each page so that it's printed right on the edge so that when you get the whole thing together, um, you have the letter on the edge. Because it's digital, printed these days, we did 30 different covers. And then tried to force um, Aaron, but the most common typist, to do something interesting. Again, by pushing the grid where it would keep breaking lines. The second issue, I've had to cut most of this out, I'm afraid, um, is because it's Relatively hardcore um, there's actually literally reasons I can only show you about five percent of this magazine. Um, trying to think of type as a window to other spaces. Um, and using something very, very simple and basic, but how it combines becomes an interesting thing and then using it almost like stained glass windows. And then using the type on the page as, as a kind of as a, as a, a, a shift. So that the image shifts inside, so you have a sense of multiple realities going on at the same time. Sometimes the type includes itself, and sometimes it's reflecting what the story is about. So here, the type is repeated on the chest, but it's slightly enlarged inside, so it gives you a, a sense that the type is part of the story and the picture. Um, 2010, when I joined the Royal College, at the other end of the extreme, we did something called the Anti-Design Festival. And it wasn't anti-design. It was thinking about design has become so um, controlled by its financial outcomes. So at the time, people wouldn't commission anything unless it was going to deliver uh, profits or bums on seats or viewers. So we did something called the Anti Design Festival, which was not about money at all, because the more you focus on cash as a way of defining your success, 
the less you actually develop culturally and the less useful it is for human beings. So we said we're going to do something that has no cash as its basis. And we lost money on it. But over 10 days, we, we had 20 venues and we had 20,000 people. Or 10 venues, 20,000 people showed and got involved. And it started with a manifesto. And that drove everything. This was our briefing document for the curators. This is where it was in Shoreditch. So using the type to define um, the map. Uh, we embraced the idea of no copyright, but we couldn't copyright no. We tried. Because copyright is a way of suffocating as well. Um, uh, it, it can be used in order to create income, but at the same time, when you're using it to protect generic drugs, um, then it becomes quite it's malicious. And this is what it was. It was all about remaking. It wasn't about buying new. It was about recycling. It was about new ideas. It was held here. It looked like this. This was our showroom. Everything in here we found in a skip within a five mile radius of the venue. And I'm not allowed to read out what the, what the neon said. I can read it out in England. So this was the waiting room. People before they went down to the exhibition. This is our technology. <laughs> All of which worked. This is Jonathan Barnbrook's piece on the right where he's using teletext as a typographic um, piece of interaction. So we had an open open entry exhibition, open submission, and we took pretty much anything that anyone sent us. Um, we ran events, experimentation, we ran workshops. This is kind of a version of um, exquisite corpses where people would be bringing different bits of object that then we put together and then unwrap at the end. Now, this is painting on film. This is a. Um, oh my god. Yuri Suzuki, um, a Japanese product designer who used a thumb scan and changed it to um, pick up shapes and convert them into sound and use it. Uh, these are some of the chairs. Um, which I doubt any of them get commercial, um, commercial commissions. But, um, this was on one side of the building. was a big iron, the London graffiti artist. This is anti, anti, anti. This is some uh, an artist with turrets. This is a, a giant pixel wall. This is our pixel, this is a digital wall. And these were black cups on a white cup wall so that people can make their own things. And actually, when the first band played, all the black bits fell off. So people started putting up their own. I mean, this is a picture of Black Sabbath, of course. Um, and people would be putting up their own, making their own murals, a few penises, I'm afraid. Um, so that's what people do. And then there was an artist designer uh, who every day, um, not, not Wilcox, sorry, my brain is gone completely jet black today. Uh, but every day for 30 days, he would create a new invention. This is day 15. Um, you'd put the fruit in the ball and kick it around. This is a smoothie maker. I'm going to run through fuse quickly. Um, this is a whole lecture in itself, um, probably be done separately. Fuse started in 1991. We started in 1990. And this was the first time where the elite practice of designing fonts um, was passed down to the advent of fontographer which meant anyone on the Mac could design typefaces and publish them. So there's a whole bunch of younger people and designers that were suddenly making typefaces, and they could be more relevant, and they didn't need to be sold commercially. And we said at the beginning of Fuse um, that language is a contract between 
two parties or two people. And the contract says that we agree that these shapes, these fixed shapes, when structured in a certain way, convey a certain meaning. That's it. That's, that's typography. That's typography. It's written language. That these things, we call them letters, that you might have other kinds of shapes that combine. But at the same time as allowing you to communicate, they're also a limitation. They also restrict what you can do. Um, in Japan, there's an expression called ma, M-A. Um, that's about the energy and the life that exists between things. And we don't really have a language that captures that. So fuse then was a way of saying, well, what happens if we use different shapes? Or what happens if we play with the shapes we have? Um, what happens if we start pushing what those shapes might mean in other emotive ways? So in this way, you find new possibilities, because language, as I said, inhibits possibilities, as well as being a very efficient distributor of ideas. So Tibor Kalman, one of my great heroes, um, did this, where he said that every uppercase letter was a good word and every lowercase letter was a bad word. So as you type, you'll have a series of good and bad um, uh, encounters. This was a typeface I did for Fuse 18, where I took the negative space of letters instead of the positive space. Um, T, uh, Tobias, for a journalist, recorded conversations on the streets of New York, cut them into small pieces, and put those snippets into different keys on the keypad. So as you typed, you would have new conversations occur. Um, Paul Ellerman got his students to be different letter forms in the passport booth. This was inspired by William Burroughs and cut-up techniques, so taking stories from the gardening newspaper, slicing them up, so as you type, you create new bits of news. Um, Burroughs was a big influence. He would say that you cannot sit and think of something new. That doesn't happen. What you need are the tools for that to happen. He developed the cut-up technique where he would take different halves of pages in the same book and bring them together. Um, and then skillfully join them up to create new stories and new meanings. This is from oh God, my brain's couple of I'll I'll do this lecture again afterwards also. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Jared Unger, where he decided he didn't want twenty six letters, he just wanted ten shapes out of which he could make any letter and any other shape he wanted. Um, on issue 10, we decided to embrace free form completely because we felt, we felt that abstract form was possible in poetry, uh, in sculpture, in architecture, in painting, in music, but it never happened so far in typography. So we were looking for the meaning of time that would happen when you take the actual words away. Because you know, if you choose Times or Cooper Black or Helvetica, this has a way of controlling the response to your words. Um, so we wanted to get rid of all of that and make it more evident. And so it's starting to look at things that might happen just as visual expressions. Again from Tobias, the idea that um, the more you type, the more illegible it became. It was his comment on noise in society. And these uh, uh, Royal College students at the time made this out of plastic spoons you found in the canteen. This is a, an identikit font where different bits of the face are in different letters. As you type, you will find a different suspect or convict, as we all are. And then this pushes it even further, it pushes it into the abstract, into the grid. Um, this is an ear on the poster itself, but it's pushing it completely beyond any sense of conventional meaning now. But in doing so, it starts to create a lot of new possibilities. Um, this is a used, um, Eric van Rossen, 
uh, sorry, I have a couple of options. Um, using DNA and chemical signatures on a thumbprint. Um, think about the control of pharmaceuticals. Stephanosagmeister's idea that all language is a virus. Um, the Russian designer Rad Hock taking handwriting to an urban extreme. And this is Jason Bailey. This is his mother. And she had multiple sclerosis at the time, and this is his mother's best attempt at writing. She wanted to use this to tell the world about her condition and how difficult it was. So sometimes there's more power in illegibility than legibility. Um, this is a picture of her when she was 16, just before she um, <coughs> suffered from the disease. This is the final piece that I did where I had gone back to this extruded typography. Um, um, it ended up as a poster on a wall in a, Russia, in a Chinese Beijing um, art complex. I had no idea what was going into this, so sometimes serendipity works. A few fonts applied to Mushroom Art, the Chinese designers. Clothing for one collection. We created this very abstract set of shapes that are, that are coming from both military and human form. We then we printed these onto plastic that we rephotographed, and then her final collection ended up looking looking like this, where she'd taken some of those shapes as part of a graphic statement. And um, finally, um, not the reason I'm here, Carol, I promise you. Um, we are launching today um, uh, Brody Fonts. Uh, it's been a long time coming, and I've actually been working with the Time Network guys now for four years on trying to get this together. Um, and the first one we've done um, is looking at what we developed for the Ashton and Scott Haller. Ashton was held in Bonn in 1991. Um, and it was designed for their signage system originally. And it's designed again to be very graphic, very noticeable, and very geometric. Um, and it was also designed these, it was also designed to work on these, these columns, um, which were modular and it would just sit very 2001 like around the space without interfering on the surfaces. Um, so here it is with the building itself. So we're trying to echo part of the building structure. It's very open, that's some geometric qualities. And here are the signs. Trying to be inventive, trying to give the fonts and the signage some light. And then this is the font we've developed, I think mean, seven, seven weights we've developed, developed a lowercase as well for this. Feels like a sales pitch, it's not. Please buy this. <laughs> the second one is one that um, you've seen that's been used on a few of the projects. It was used for the anti design festival stuff. But it was originally developed for um, an issue of, of Arena One Plus celebrating the London stylists and fashion and music group called Buffalo. Yeah. And these are the early experiments I found that we did around that. This is the first ideas from the magazine. Uh, very much using this kind of bold, um, very confident, very solid, and then the contrast of the small size. Then using these containers. This is a page from the magazine on the left of Ray Petri, a great stylist who, who passed away unfortunately. And then how it was used on the Anti Design Festival. So trying to trying to keep these things in common, because they had common kind of objectives, which was to get us to rethink some of the things that we do. And then just use this on a 
opposed to um, as a, an international effort for different countries to design posters to look for this year's World Cup, which starts now. I'm going to have to go home and watch it. So, no message really, um, except challenge everything, except nothing. Um, every generation deserves its own language, um, so our languages should never be fixed. So keep looking for new stuff. If someone tells you something is true, don't believe them. Um, vote for Trump. I'm joking. <laughs> um, and um, I think we'll join you.